listening to Cap Conversation, the digital discourse of financial services today with Capco and guests. In today's episode, we are discussing the evolving partnership between Capco and the Stevens Institute of Technology. Our guest today is Dr. George Calhoun, an industry professor and the founding director of the Quantitative Finance Program at Stevens Institute of Technology, one of the oldest engineering universities in the United States. Prior to joining academia, Dr. Calhoun spent over 30 years in the wireless communications industry at the executive and board levels at several public companies, including CEO and chairman of the board of Illinois Superconductor Corporation. Dr. Calhoun is also an author of three published books on advanced wireless technology and application and has a new book already on the shelves, Price and Value, A Guide to Equity Market Valuation Metrics, published this year by Springer Press. And without further ado, Dr. George Calhoun. Hi, George. Welcome. Um, I hope everything's going well on your end. Hey Robert, yeah, it's uh, it's going okay. I mean, it's like everybody else. We're in uh, a strange state these days, but um, we're adjusting. Absolutely. Why don't we jump in and start talking about, a little bit about your your background? So, um, I was reading up a little bit, and I noticed that uh, you started in in the wireless tech industry. Uh, you were the co-founder of Interdigital Communications. Uh, which was a company that helped bring 2G and 3D uh, 3G architecture to the world. What was it like to be a part of that industry at what was basically the beginning of, of that industry? Well, uh, so I've had two lifetimes, so to speak, professionally. And the first one was about 30 years in the wireless business. And the second one has been now about uh, 17, 18 years as an academic in the finance world. Well, I think what I'm, I'm most interested in is what lessons did you carry with you uh, into your into the finance industry and as, as well as a professor now um, that you really picked up while working in, in the uh, wireless tech industry? Well, let me just uh, frame it for you. Um, so I got involved in the wireless industry in 1980, which is to say before there was a wireless industry. There was no <laughs> cellular radio. There was no regulatory framework. There was no spectrum available for it. Um, it was an idea that was being hatched in a few places at AT&T and Motorola and others. But um, the company that I became a part of, and we did our first public offering in early, uh, late 1981, uh, was um, we had done the work on the fundamental technology in wireless at the time that was FM, frequency modulated radio. It's the same FM still used today in a, a lot of different applications. But what we had learned was that the FM uh, radio architecture was not going to work for cellular mm -hmm. radio. And we learned that before the big guys did. They they were holding back to get everything sort of lined up, all the, the regulations and the spectrum before they tried to build the system. They launched their systems in the early 80s, and they basically uh, choked. Within uh, a year or two, it was clear that they had a, a serious problem with capacity. Frequency modulation is a great technology, but it is not an efficient one in the use of the, radio, the finite radio spectrum. So we, our company, had already sort of gone through that learning curve, and we were into the digital world, digitizing the radio signal and constructing, learning how to construct digital radio signals that today is, um, is something we take for granted. But at the time, it mm -hmm. was a very challenging uh, uh, new frontier in science. The, the first system that we built in 1985, which became the basis of the patent uh, portfolio that we eventually uh, built the business around after trying several other business models, um, that first system, the, the test system, was probably, I would say, the size of a small refrigerator. <laughs> and it had um, it needed a Honda generator to power it in the parking lot when we did the uh, the, the demonstration out in San Diego. To your question, uh, I realized that uh, starting a company and being successful with a company in the tech tech world is 
is going to involve probably three things. One is raising money, learning how to access the capital markets when you have not a full up business yet, but you have ideas, mm -hmm. you have prospects, you have a business plan, you have early customers. Putting that story together and interacting with the financial markets was a big part of the learning that I went through. We did five public offerings and really all of them or four of them before we had any profits at all. So it was, that was wow. a challenging um, part of the business. The second part of the business that I came to appreciate was the importance of intellectual property. It's interesting mm -hmm. that I can tell you in, 19, in the early 1980s, most companies did not pay very much attention to intellectual property. Uh, we, oh, wow. we, we funded development with a variety of uh, outside partners in voice coding and signal processing in different areas. And at the time, we would say, we would, by the way, we'll pay for this and we would like to get all the patent rights. And they'd say, sure, you go pay for it, pay the patent attorneys. It's all yours. You're welcome to it. Um, that's not the way they think about it today, but that was, that was another uh, part of the learning process. And mm -hmm. the third part of the learning process, I would say, was that whatever else you did right or wrong, um, if you kept care of your customers, it sounds like a cliche, but that's what let you, that's what let us survive. You know, we inevitably had problems, we inevitably have things that don't work. Uh, New technology is always going to have its issues. If you focus entirely on the technology and not and don't pay enough attention to the customer side of the equation, uh, I think that's where a lot of these companies run on the rocks. That's really sound advice. Um, I, I think that some companies, to your point, forget who's most important. Um, it's great that you have something to sell, but if if your customers no longer want to go with you on that journey. Um, they won't, uh, and and you lose your base. Um, it is, uh, I think, a foundation to branding 101 now. Uh, it, when you speak about branding, that is certainly an aspect that is is highly um, uh, discussed with with executive teams when making those decisions. Um, and, I, and I still feel that that companies don't necessarily pay attention the way they should, and it's and it's uh, incredibly. Uh, you know, a very, very good advice for, for future startups. Well, if you think about it, if you lay out all your assets on the table, the fixed, the, the, the visible tangible assets that you know about and, you know, starting with cash and accounts receivable and inventory and stuff and ranging all the way to the intangible assets that the accountants don't, don't see and don't list on your balance sheet, but everybody knows like brand, like design, um, and then you ask, which ones actually generate the dollars that come into your company? And the answer is, number one are the customers. And repeat yeah. customers, loyal, stable customers. Every, I, I almost think that everything else is about capturing those loyal customers. Um, the technology edge, the branding, the uh, strong design capabilities, um, Anyhow, I, I know that sounds like a, a very simple mantra, but it, it, it's one of the things that I learned uh, out of that experience. I would say another, another observation I'll make uh, of how that experience then rolls forward into what we're doing today is um, the finance industry in that day was so completely non-technological that it's shocking to remember it. Mm -hmm. We didn't have Excel. Nobody did. Nobody, nobody in the business would deign to put their hands on a keyboard and mess with a computer. In those wow. days, even with Lotus people. One, Two, Three, <laughs> it was a people business. Well, I mean, you yeah. had if you needed a spreadsheet, to, if you needed something cooked up, you had a you know somebody in the closet literally. <laughs> in the basement, but if you were an executive or um, you know a player in the finance world in the 80s, uh, you were, you know, your hands were clean. You didn't mess with the technology. You were very proud of that fact. You were happy to be a person-to-person -person contact and you did your deals on the golf course. And it was all about getting into the right networks to put your syndicates together. 
And of course, that's now completely different, but it, it's, it's given me a perspective on the transformation of the finance industry that um, at least I find has been helpful to see how one after another, the technology is sort of, you know, the waves are, are rolling over these sandcastles of uh, the old business models and um, mm -hmm. transforming them. And it's happened in trading, it's happened in capital markets, uh, it's happening now in other segments of the business, um, including wealth management, that uh, is an area that we're going to be working with Capco on. So Excellent. Uh, you did mention it earlier, but I want to just give the time frame. You said you started with interdigital communications in the 80s. It wasn't until 2003 that you joined Stevens Institute of Technology which now your areas of focus are more in finance. And in fact, you have a book coming out or is it uh, has been released already That's called so. uh, Price and Value, A Guide to Equity Market Valuation Metrics. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that book uh, as well as uh, how this ties into your areas of focus uh, as a professor at, at Stevens? So I've just published a, my, the first of what I think will be a series of books uh, in this uh, finance field for me. I just uh, brought the first one out with Springer, uh, the German publisher. You know, I've also, there's just uh, within the past two weeks, uh, I was uh, invited to come on as a Forbes columnist uh, for Forbes magazine. And I put up two, my first two, uh, on, and it's all online. And it's amazing. I'm, I'm watching every day. I did one, I, I put one up, uh, I guess it was day before yesterday and already 3,500 people have seen it. And wow. that's not a huge number in the scope of things, but for me, it's a huge number. How, how yeah. long would it have been to, you know, to sell and deliver 3,500 copies of, uh, of one of those books back in the day? So, and it goes on and on. It's, it, it's, so yeah, it's an interesting um, experience to uh, kind of design a thought leadership uh, profile in this uh, era of social social media, modern technology, all of that. Plus, now in the pandemic world, uh, it's kind of accelerated that trend. I think mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, it's a very teachable moment. Uh, mm -hmm. The financial industry is absorbing stresses that uh, are extraordinary, and that a lot of people would have worried uh, could they absorb it, and the markets are handling it and you know, whether it's volatility or liquidity challenges or the circuit breakers hitting, um, but all kinds of interesting things going on in the market you, that you might have waited 20 years to see. Yeah. Do you think that that might have anything to do with maybe studying previous examples of what we're going through? Like, how did the markets deal with the Spanish flu in 1918? How did the Great Depression that came later? If we study those times, do you think they kind of informed how we deal with our current situation, and, and maybe we are learning from the past, or I, I, I would say the short answer to that is no. Uh, that the market, <laughs> one of the errors that a lot of, in my opinion, that a lot of people make when they try to understand the financial market is that they view it as a physical system, like a physical system that would have invariant laws of behavior. Mm -hmm. So lots of academics will go back and they'll study what happened in the 30s, 40s, or some of the time series go back to the late 1800s, and they'll derive a uh, a principle or or a law of behavior that um, you know sort of pretends as though this were a physical system that had that kind of law of behavior. But in fact, the market is a social technical system that is mutating all the time. The behaviors all the in the market today are very different than they were even in the 2008 crisis. Uh, they're faster, for example. The, uh, the, the downslope and the upslope and the volatility, all of that, everything is happening much faster in this crisis than it happened in the previous crisis. And, uh, and that'll be very interesting to watch. The volumes are tremendous. The, I mean, half the market today is uh, generated out of computer engineered uh, platforms. Wow. So, <clears throat> You know, when the trend changes, the computers jump on it, and and the reaction is is much faster, and maybe in some cases more severe because all the computers kind of have similar uh, 
similar views of the market or a lot of them have similar views. So they all move in the same moment and rush to the other side of the ship. And a lot of the volatility, the sloshing around in the market is driven by this, I think. As a thought leader in the industry, I saw that you set up the Hanlon Financial Systems Research Center at Stevens Institute of Technology. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that research center and, and what you're looking to accomplish? We've taken a couple of steps that I think are positive in this respect. One is we've integrated most of those disciplinary perspectives into one school in the university, which is the business school. So we have financial engineering, financial analytics, big data, classical finance, mathematics, computer science, all integrated into uh, programs that are run by one dean, one faculty that's an integrated faculty. And I think that's, that's a big part of our success so far as a university. But the other uh, piece of it was to create a platform for the research so that mm -hmm. we have people in computer science, we, and that's what they do. We have people in natural language processing, and that's what they do. We have people in uh, math, pure math, or statistics. You're going to speak to Professor Florescu a little bit later today, I think. Statistician, mathematician, um, all of those perspectives need to come together to be effective, I think, in addressing the issues of the modern financial markets. And it sounds like what you're doing is putting these teams together to collaborate and speak together upon the same problem instead of working against each other or in silos, which uh, certainly will likely come to an answer much quicker as they work together and learn to speak to one another. Taking that idea to the next level, we went to the National Science Foundation. Uh, National Science Foundation is charged with, uh, it's a branch of the government that's charged with the mission of promoting science and technology uh, in our society and particularly giving focus where maybe the uh, existing players aren't giving the right kind of focus to a problem that's emergent. And they have a, um, a model that's called the Industry University Cooperative Research Center, IUCRC. They've used this for uh, decades. Uh, there are dozens of them that they have set up. And the model is to take a consortium of universities and a uh, similar um, consortium of industry partners and create with the support of the National Science Foundation a research center that is going to focus on some topic that needs, that isn't being addressed well in the academic setting because of this siloing, and that needs the industry participation. So there are dozens of them focused on various, um, various scientific, mostly hard science problems. We have just been awarded the first one to focus on financial science and technology. We're partnering with Georgetown and Georgetown University and RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic. Uh, and we have, um, the, it's, it's brand, it's, you know, it's brand new. It's news. It's just, just starting now. But over the next year, year and a half, two years, we will create this research center that will bring industry partners like CAPCO. Uh, to the table with university expertise and the, you know, so it's another level of integrative activity as opposed to letting things sort of stay in their silos. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited about that. I think it's going to take its, it'll take time because it's a, it's a very organic cumulative process that the government supervises. But, um, you know, if you look at some of these centers, the program, the, the uh, scope of it is a 15-year program, and some of these research centers are now multi-million dollars, more than $10 million every year of research activity with large groups of industry players as well as strong university players. And it's time to do that in the finance field, and we're the ones that are going to do it, and I'm pretty excited about that. You mentioned it. We, we will be partnering together, CAPCO and Stevens Institute yes. of Technology. What aspect are we partnering together on? Well, we are, CAPCO is, uh, 
is an early uh, early adopter of this idea, uh, and thank you very much for that. Um, it's what that means is that we have already a bilateral partnership with Capco, and we're focusing on uh, a couple of early stage areas of research. One is the shift project, so called, that we may talk about. Um, we're also looking now, we have a call this afternoon on wealth management and technologies that will enhance wealth management uh, as a function in the industry, a large and important function that hasn't really been, I would say, technologized very strongly yet. Um, so we have those research activities uh, in a bilateral relationship with uh, CAPCO. Excellent. Well, tell us a little bit about SHIFT, if you can. The markets are now, uh, as I've said, they're automated. Uh, all the mar all the important markets are are automated electronic markets, and um, I'll, I'll I'll come into the topic from this angle. Uh, about two years ago, the um, Commodities and Futures Trading Commission (CFTC). Uh, which regulates all the markets except the stock market. The SEC regulates, the Security and Exchange Commission regulates the stock market, but CFTC regulates the futures markets, the options markets, and so forth. They came out, CFTC came out with a uh, request for rulemaking advice, notice of proposed rulemaking, to examine the problem that their regulatory regime was still in the manual era, assuming that trades are being made by people walking across a floor and handing a piece of paper to some <laughs> one person to another, which is how it was not long ago. Yeah. But it is now not that anymore. It is a highly automated, high-speed market, and the regulatory framework hasn't caught up with that. That's one issue that they highlighted. The other issue that they highlighted is that because the market has now become this automated network of networks, it's got new vulnerabilities. And the vulnerabilities, it does some things much better than the old markets did, but it's vulnerable to, uh, let's call it, um, any piece of software that gets plugged into that live market that has uh, a problem as software sometimes can have. Uh, and there are some classic examples of this. Uh, Knight Capital, uh, a big player in the markets uh, infrastructure not that long ago. Uh, you know, one day at nine o'clock, they plugged in a piece of software that they thought was gonna help, you know, improve the user interface in some fashion. And by uh, 9.30, they were bankrupt because the software had gone crazy and had generated obligations that they couldn't uh, shed, and uh, it put them into a, a state of distress almost instantaneously. There, there are many examples, many stories. There are crashes that take place in these markets that are unexplained. Um, technology has a lot of risks associated with it that we don't fully understand always yet. So the CFTC came out with a, a mandate to the industry saying, what we need is the ability to have a test bed for any new piece of software, a trading algorithm, a, uh, any, anything that's gonna interact with the market. Kind of like the way I would say it, they didn't say it in their rulemaking, but the way I say it is, it's kind of like the uh, Food and Drug Administration testing a drug clinically in a small trial or a series of small trials before they release it to the general public. Yeah, making sure and it's relatively safe for, for, for everyone. Yeah. That's right. And they mandated, the CFTC mandated, we want the industry to develop this capability to have a test bed that will thoroughly, as thoroughly as possible, evaluate and test the uh, functionality and the risk potential of any new piece of software that you're gonna put into the market. That is what SHIFT is. SHIFT is a um, model of the market that is uh, in its detail highly realistic. Uh, it is 
granular to the same level as the market. And what I mean by that is we use real-time pricing, tick level pricing, tick level data from all the different exchanges. There are dozens of exchanges in the market today. It's not an integrated uh, single exchange or even one or two, it's dozens of them. So you've got a complex set of pricing situations, market makers, um, behavior is, is evolving all the time. All of that should be replicated in a simulation platform that's capable of then saying, all right, now we want to plug this algorithm into the market and see what happens. Or another use is if you're the CFTC, you might say, we'd like to implement this new piece of regulatory policy. We'd like to say that, for example, um, you can't have microsecond uh, bids you know, flashed and then withdrawn. You have to put a bid up and hold it for one second or something of, mm -hmm. of that order. This is the kind of thing that's been talked about a lot in terms of stabilizing certain parts of the market behavior. Well, you don't really know what the effects of that would be. And regulators have been reluctant to go out and implement new rules that may sound quite reasonable, but you put them into the live market without testing and you're not quite sure what might happen. So they have mandated, let's have a test bed platform that can allow all these different players, traders, market makers, exchange operators, and regulators to really probe and test the effects of new, tech, new, new technologies, new pieces of software that are gonna go into this market and interact with it. And that's what we're doing. That's what the SHIFT project is about. Excellent. Well, I want to remind the listeners that um, they can get your book, Price Value, a guide to equity market valuation metrics on Amazon.com. Where can our listeners find out more information about the Hanlon Financial Systems Research Center and the partnership with Capco? I'm sure you can find out about our partnership on Capco.com. Uh, but from a Stevens Institute of Technology standpoint, is there a, a particular website they can go to or blog that they should pay attention to to learn more? Um, yes, there, the Hanlon Center has its own website, uh, and um, I will uh, let uh, Professor Florescu, I think, uh, give you the details of that, but it's pretty thorough. And I also saw just today that uh, it crossed the wire. There's an announcement of the Capco uh, Stevens um, partnership has now been put on the public uh, newswire. So I think there's going to be news about that at the Stevens Institute level as well. Uh, Excellent. I also, I, I have to mention, in addition to the book, they should check out this new Forbes column. I think it's going to be where I put a lot of my energy in the next six months. Uh, and uh, you can look it up. Yes. If you Google Forbes and George Calhoun, you'll get to it. And in fact, you have two articles up, How COVID-19 Will Change Finance for the Fed and the Bond Market. Go ahead and uh, make sure you check that out. That's the most recent article. Uh, the first article was How COVID-19 Will Change Finance, Fear, Federalism, and Fixed Income. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time and look forward to hopefully after everything is said and done, we can shake hands and, and meet face to face. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Robert. You've been listening to Cap Conversation, a Capco production. This podcast is for information only and should not and does not constitute consulting services. Mm -hmm.